men who challenge fate, and there are men who are its dupes. I'd show you a life for them. Well, too. There are men of action, and there are men of straw. There are men who take risks, and there are men who play safe. Well, there was nothing of the heroic mode about Henry Cornwallis. Excuse me. Henry was not an extraordinary man. Uh, but he died an extraordinary death. A courageous death. Alone on a Swiss mountainside. Come along. Mrs. Cornwallis, shall we go back to the house? You know, here in this town, we worry about what we're inclined to think of as our problems. Moving into a new era. Freedom from unemployment. Jobs and homes for everyone. That's what we think of, isn't it? They're That's big surprised. problems, Percy. Well, I believe that this one man's single-handed battle with the elements proves to us once again that, in fact, there can finally be only one solution to all our troubles. It is personal courage. The individual drive that gets us up to do something and stop moaning to achieve that glory which transcends self-interest. Exactly. Would you see who that is, George, please? Certainly. Yes. You know, I have to talk, Mrs. Cornwallis, into letting us use the house for this meeting this evening. Oh, yes? But I wanted it to be here. Because it was his home. Oh, quite, quite. I want you to know something of the character of this man. Meet the lady who's now his widow. See something of his family. Before asking you to help me to start this fun. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to wait till George gets back. What are you going to call the fun, Percy? Oh, I think the Henry Cornwallis Memorial Fund, simple and direct. Oh, very appropriate. What? It's not possible. I'm afraid it's more than possible. Now, may I see Mrs. Cornwallis, please? Just a minute. Wait here, will you? Very much. There is a lot of money in this town. We must dig some of it out. <laughs> you, Gordon, I'm depending on you to raise up the entire Chamber of Commerce. Now, there should be fates, and bazaars, swimming galas, that sort of thing. Uh, 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 excuse me. Yeah. I'm afraid it's the police. Oh? Uh, excuse me, something appears to have happened. I'll be back in just a moment. What the devil have the police got to do with all of this? I asked to see Mrs. Cornwallis. Who are you? Well, who are you? It seems to be more to the point. Now, what the hell's going on? Sergeant Hicks, CID, the fraud squad. And you? The fraud Well, my name is Sayers. I was the manager at Mr. Cornwallis's bank. He worked for me for 15 years. I'm a close friend of the family. Henry is now dead. We're uh, holding a little meeting to try and raise some money. Did you say fraud squad? Is Mrs. Cornwallis attending this fundraising meeting? Well, yes, of course. The money's for her and the children. Was this your idea, Mr. Sayers? Yes, it was. Now, look, Miss... Um... Sergeant Hicks. Sergeant, you can't come bursting in here suggesting... Just exactly what are you suggesting? How much money have you raised? A thousand pounds. There was a spontaneous collection in the town as soon as the action was reported. Have you given it to Mrs. Cornwallis yet? No, I'm about to. I shouldn't, if I were you. Are you suggesting that I'm involved in something? Mr. Cornwallis worked for you for quite some time. Was he an honest man? Did you trust him? Are you talking about the money? Is that what it's all about? I don't know. Is it? Well, uh, I paid the money back. Uh, it's true, he did embezzle 300 pounds from the bank. It was the scandal, you see. I didn't want his wife and children to face a scandal. So he's embezzled money as well? As well as what? Mr. Sayers, you are asking a whole town to contribute to a fund to help the wife and children of a man who may be alive. Percy, what's happening? He's dead! I don't think you can have read this report, Gamble. Not properly. Philip says that Cornwallis has been seen. There's a statement here from the man who saw him. 
I have read it. One witness. And how do we know he's reliable? There's a good deal more evidence which says that Cornwallis is at the bottom of that crevasse. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. It's not in your interest to believe it. Look, you organize a competition for a solo climb of Mount... Uh, whatever it is. Sorry, Val. Uh, thank you. Thirty-seven of your climbers go up your mountain for a first prize of £5,000. You get unlimited publicity, including the sponsorship of a daily paper. On your own admission, you've got a squad of salesmen standing by to flood Europe with the climbing equipment you manufacture. That's got nothing at all to do with it. Uh, everything runs perfectly until one of your climbers plummets down that crevasse. That puts you right in it. If Cornwallis is dead, you're responsible. You've risked people's lives for your own profit. I had a rescue team standing by. There were marshals posted on the mountain. But nowhere near that crevasse. Up above, yes. See them approaching the crevasse and coming away from ah, it. But not crossing it. A young man died there ten years ago. John, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Poulson. And he's still down there. Now, some of your climbers were unskilled. The Berg's Run was the only tricky spot on that mountain. The what? The Bergsrund. It's a crevasse which separates the upper snow slopes from the glacier. Very dangerous by the sound of it. And by the look of it. Shouldn't it only be tackled by people who know what they're doing? If Cornwallis didn't know what he was doing, he shouldn't have entered. Wasn't it up to you to stop people with insufficient experience from entering? Oh, this is getting us nowhere. Phillips, when are you going back to Potville? This afternoon to take over from my manager. Somebody's got to look for him. Yeah, well, I'd like you to go back with him. To Potville. Now, why? To look for Cornwallis, that's why. But that's absurd, sir. He disappeared 12 days ago. If he is alive, do you think he's going to turn up in the village where the climb started from, where he'd be recognised? He'd be miles away. He's already been seen there. Reportedly. And even if I do find him, there's no warrant for his arrest. Attempting by deception to dishonestly obtain money from the people of Nurture. All right. Where's the extradition warrant, sir? I'm afraid no Swiss magistrate will grant us one. I'm reliably informed that our case against Cornwallis is tenuous. I'll say it is. Oh, look, why are we assuming that he's a con man? Now, just a minute, Gamble. It's not quite as tenuous as all that. I had a call from Sergeant Hicks. Cornwallis has embezzled money from his bank. Hmm. Well, twisting a bank is hardly the same thing as taking a whole town for a ride. Our job is to prove intent to defraud. I'm afraid hoping they'll start a fund for him isn't enough for an extradition warrant. Look, if there's only a warrant for him in the UK, now what the hell am I going out there for? To try and find him and to talk him back. To talk him back. All, all this because Phillips, Mr. Uh, Phillips... Mr. Phillips allows a rumour that he's still alive to get out of hand and we've got to waste our time following it up. You're taking a most foolish attitude, Inspector. I inaugurated this venture with only one motive. That was to try and encourage a rebirth of the pioneering spirit of this nation. I'm an indoors man myself. We used to go out, sail the seas, chart continents, discover new worlds. Today we're mollycoddle, sheltered, cosseted, wet nurse from cradle to the grave. Certainly I stand to profit by the success of this competition. <laughs> but isn't it up to people like me to give a lead? One man against a mountain. Now, that's the challenge. It's positively romantic. You want to listen to what he says, Gamble? Might do yourself a bit of good. But look, sir, I'm not climbing any mountain. Instead of all these late nights playing pontoon or whatever it is you get up to, and you get out in the open air. Get some of that pioneer spirit inside of you, a little less of the double scotch type. Now, I've always been interested in watches and clocks myself, Mr. Phillips. Finding out what makes them tick. Now, there's an adventure for you. Uh, a pitons for hammering in the rock, but what the hell's an effort? It's a ladder for climbing up mountains. Well, they're using ladders, are they? What's happening to the pioneering spirit? And we're becoming a nation of window cleaners. Well, how'd you get on? How did she take it? It's a very funny setup. I think Cornwallis has taken the whole of Mersham for a ride up that mountain. Not you as well. Can you prove it? I'm going to. I'm going back with a search warrant. Oh, well, what the hell are you searching for? Well, the man's a villain. He's already nicked 300 quid from the bank where he works. His boss has been covering up for him. And after she got over the shock of hearing that her husband was still alive, Mrs. Cornwallis turned quite nasty. Well, that's natural. You walk in there, accuse her heroic hubby of attempted fraud. She blows her top. Well, what did you expect? She could be part of it, you see. They could have set it up between them. And this fellow Sayers, who organizes funds, he could be masterminding the whole thing. Mm. 
Well, she told me to get out, so I'm going back. He may have kept a diary, there may be letters. Or a one-way ticket to Tahiti. Look, I'm being serious. I oh, know. Look, I think that Cornwallis is stone-cold dead at the bottom of that crevasse. He called it his mountainarium. Most of the pictures of mountains are of Mount Charival. That's the crevasse. That's the picture of John Poulson who died down there. It's the last picture that was taken. What was the purpose of all this? To get to know the mountain. He studied it for six months in here. He was determined that nothing should go wrong. He got to know Poulson's Gap pretty well, though. Every step. What are these? He made endless recordings. He simulated the climb. He considered every condition that might present itself up there. He was determined to get to the top quicker than anyone else. The breaks in the clouds mean the weather's getting better. But watch out for any cirrus. It'll get worse. Watch the clouds, Henry. Always watch the clouds. Henry? He's talking to himself. For God's sake, look out for the southwesterly. It'll bring all hell down on you. What is this evidence that Henry may still be alive? Well, he was seen. Well, not for certain. Whoever thought they saw him could easily be mistaken. Mr. Phillips had marshals posted on the mountain. <clears throat> he had one about here on this plateau with a view of the Bergstrand. Now, the marshal saw your husband approach the crevasse, then he lost sight of him as he went behind this rib of rock here. To get across, Mr. Cornwallis would have had to straddle the crevasse and work his way up the steep upper lip of the Bergstrand by carving out footholds and using pitons. The marshal waited for him to appear again in his view, but he didn't, so he hurried down to the crevasse. He thought at once that Mr. Cornwallis had fallen in. That's when the alert went out and they started the search. But then they found some of your husband's equipment a few yards down the crevasse, with no sign of a fall below that. He hadn't hammered his piton into the rock at all. Where are the children? They're away at my mother's. I'm alone here. Go on, more of your evidence. It was as if he'd thrown his equipment down there to look as if he'd fallen. But they saw nothing more of him. Well, there is a route, apparently. Here it is. You can go round this rib of rock here without being seen and eventually reach a route which leads to these chalets. He could have taken that route and either left the area completely or hidden there until the competition was over. And do you mean that on the strength of these assumptions, police are being sent out there to dig up my husband's remains? To try to find him. Oh, this is a nightmare. I can't work it out at all. One moment my husband's a hero, the next he's being chased by police. What on earth do you imagine he's done? I thought you could help me with that. Oh, he's making a new life for himself somewhere. Why, we grow fat on the money Percy's is collecting. Is that what you mean? Not necessarily. Perhaps you think that we arranged it between ourselves before he left. And that I'm just waiting for things to blow over before I flit with the funds and join him on some desert island. Is that what you think? Yes. Watch the wind, Henry. Repeat, if it comes from the north or the east, there won't be much change. But just you watch that southwesterly. Listen! Just look at that. One man's struggle to reach the top. Isn't that what life's all about? What's French for there's no heating in this room? Thank you. Isn't it a bit early to go to bed? I am not in bed. <laughs> perhaps it'd be better if you were. Well, perhaps I'd better remind you that without an extradition warrant, I'm just the same as any other tourist in this town. I have no power to detain anyone, set up roadblocks, or search cars. This is the coldest, wettest, dampest spot in the Western Hemisphere. And I'm starting this damn cold... <laughs> Sorry about that. And I thought you told me that Cornwallis checked you at this hotel on the 12th. He did. I gave them a week to prepare for the glide, to get to know the route. He didn't check in at this hotel or any other hotel. They all checked in here on the 12th. All except Cornwallis. I paid his bill. Then you paid in error. His name isn't even on the register. Now, are you sure he ever started this climb at all? I saw him leave the hut. I tipped him off on a lift. And what about his luggage? Uh, did he take his suitcase up the mountain with him? Of course he didn't. Well? Perhaps he went straight up to the hut, to a climber's hut. Perhaps he didn't check in at a hotel because he didn't intend coming back here at all. 
Maybe he went up there to kill himself. It's ridiculous. Could have killed himself anywhere. Why should he come here to do that? What's French for eating? Huh? Hello. Yeah, it's for you. Yeah, just a minute. Hello. Oui. Oh, hello, Jack. What's that? Good God. Where? When's it due? Stay there. Be right with you. What were the odds you gave me? A million to one against Cornwallis turning up. Well, he has. He's on Potterville Station at the moment. My manager saw him taking a suitcase out of a locker. He's waiting for the Milan Express. I'm glad we don't all share your defeatist attitude, Mr. Gamble. Now, one moment, Mr. Phillips. Before we go, bear this in mind. I have no power to arrest him. My orders are to talk him back to England. He can refuse to go with us. He's within his right. You said he was dead. I was right. It's a try-on. Don't you owe me an apology, Mr. Gamble? Not yet, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Cornwallis. Yes? Uh, how do you do? My name's Gamble. Oh, well, should I know you? You should know me, Mr. Cornwallis. Oh, hello, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, sir. No, I don't. No. Well, well, well. Mm. Um, I, I heard, uh, who was it? Hogarth from Northampton one. Is that right, sir? Five hours, 52 minutes? Uh, this is Detective Inspector Gamble, CID. The Fraud Squad. The what? The Fraud Squad. What the hell's all this about? You're not getting away with it. That's if you don't mind, about. Mr. Phillips. I'm investigating what was at first thought to be your death on the mountain. My death? That's right. Well, that's ridiculous. Yes, it is, isn't it? And you, uh, I'm sorry, ha have you come all this way to investigate me? Little me? Little you. Well, perhaps you'd like to explain. I mean, here am I minding my own business on this train, and suddenly Scotland Yard is sitting there asking me questions. I haven't asked any yet. Oh, well, never mind. We can always talk about the scenery, can't we? It's a pity you Now, where are you going? Mind your own damn business. Listen, you better answer any questions. Phillips, please. I don't have to answer any questions from anybody. I didn't ask you to come in here. Have you got a warrant for my arrest? Not here. What does that mean? In the UK, not here. Well, for, for my arrest? What for? You are deputy manager of the Wheeled Bank in Mersham. Yes. Dan Mersham's your hometown. Yes, that's right. They've started a fund. They think you're dead. The people of Mersham have been asked to contribute to the support of your wife and children. <laughs> oh, that's great, that is. That is really great. How much did they get? <laughs> I'm glad he thinks this is so funny. H has she uh, collected the insurance money yet? No, we checked that. You didn't increase your cover before you left. This isn't an insurance fraud, is it? Well, what sort of a bloody fraud is it, then? But first we thought you were dead. You went behind that rock, then you didn't come out. But you didn't cross the pool, said Scamp. I didn't. You slung your stuff down that crevasse, then double back round the rock to make it look as if you'd fallen. You turned this whole competition into a farce. We've had people risking their lives to try and get down that gap, and have you oh, for a moment? Well, surely that calls for some sort of explanation, Mr. Collins. There's nothing to explain. I did cross Poulsen's Gap. You did not. I crossed the Gap and went on up. My marshals didn't see you. I don't care what your marshals saw. I went up. You're a liar. Look, I don't have to take this from you. Now I took you off this bloody train. Take it easy, Mr. Phillips. If he does decide to throw you off this train, I have no intention of trying to stop him. I mean, I've got this terrible cold. 
All right, so you crossed the crevasse and went on up. The marshals didn't see you, right. Now, why? Why didn't you check in at the top? Well, it, it, it was not worth it. I mean, it was past my time, anyway. But there was 50 pounds and your expenses just for checking in up there. Well, are you so well off that you can afford to turn down 50 quid and stand the cost of the trip yourself? Well, I was ashamed. You see, I mean, I was angry with myself for taking so long, so I... I decided to pack it in and move around the countryside, see the sights. For 12 days? That's right, yes. Did you go back to Potville? Not until today, no, no. I, I decided to have a go at sleeping rough, you know. I, I lived wild. I'm, I'm taking a holiday. But you were seen in Potterville five days ago. Oh, no, no, that is rubbish. I'm sorry, but that's absolute rubbish. I have not been back to Potterville since climbing Charleval. I just came back today to pick up my things. Why haven't you contacted your wife? She wasn't expecting me to. Uh, Mr. Cornwallis, why are you travelling this way? I'm continuing my holiday. I'm going to Milan. Your wife knows nothing about that. Oh, yes, she does. That's not what you told her. Then what the hell is she trying to do to me? What did he say before he left? What? How did he leave you? What was he like? He kissed the children goodbye. Said he'd climb it in under six hours and bring me back a cheque for five thousand pounds. Didn't he say when he'd be home? He said he wouldn't stay overnight to take the plane straight back. Was he strange in any way? No. Look, it's getting very late. Are you sure you don't want to come back in the morning? I don't want to go on bothering you, Mrs. Cornwallis. I'd rather get this done tonight, if you don't mind. Are you a single girl? Yes. What an intriguing life you live. I don't get much of a kick out of prying into people's affairs. I'm sorry to have to worry you like this. Those books are in such an awful state. My housekeeping accounts are in chaos. But didn't your husband keep them? I should have thought working at a bank. He, he was... locked himself away in his hut. He had no time for his family or household affairs. He turned everything over to me. I see no mention here of 300 pounds. What 300 pounds? The 300 pounds that Mr. Sayers says your husband stole from the bank. Stole? He said that? He said that your husband transferred some money into his own account, and when Mr. Sayers tackled him about it, he said that he'd borrowed it to finance the expedition. He did borrow it. He did it with Mr. Sayers' full knowledge. And he says that the only reason why he didn't charge your husband was out of sympathy for you. How dare he say that's not true. Oh, Miss Hicks, everyone's turning against my husband now. Even his best friends. You've no idea how much people have changed in the past 24 hours. Look at these. For months before he left for Switzerland, the local papers were calling my husband our hero. Look, the intrepid Cornwallis. Long articles about him. Listen to this. He works at the bank round the corner. He lives in a Victorian semi-detached in the suburbs. He mows his lawn every Sunday morning. Only he didn't. I had to do that. He's a paragon of middle-class respectability, yet this ordinary man will be pitting his strength, skill, wits and courage against a rugged alpine colossus and some of the finest climbers in the country. And so it goes on. Last it found someone to hero worship. It drove all the town's problems off the front pages. But now it seems they've lost their hero and they're turning on him. Even Percy. Oh, I hope that's not the papers again. I'm not talking to any more reporters. Go away on my behalf, please. Bloody Sayers. You were in a bad way financially. Not at all. How much do you earn as an assistant bank manager? Uh, Fifteen hundred a year? Look, this was it. I had fitted out a, a mountain hut at home and I asked Sayers if I could borrow the money for it from the bank. But he wouldn't let me have an overdraft, but he did say I could borrow the money from a quarterly account. How are you going to pay it back? Bloody Sayers. I suppose he's the one who started this fund. Mm. Yes, he would. What do you mean, he would? Uh, well, well, I mean, he would, wouldn't he? He's a respected alderman in the town, a bank manager, we're very good friends. I mean, he wouldn't be the one to start a fund. Good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You hungry, Mr. Goldwallis? No, 12 days up a mountain living off goat's milk and berries. I should think he is. Don't know about you, but I could do with a meal. You're right, you are. You carry on, Mr. Phillips. We'll join you. You've got a lot to answer, Mr. Goldwallis. Midday tomorrow, I've got to be at the Dorchester to give the winner his cheque. What I'm doing on the Orient Express or whatever it is at this time of night, I don't know. Yes. I'll tell them you'll be along. Uh, look, 
I have no policeman's rights on this train or anywhere else outside the UK. You don't even have to talk to me. Why shouldn't I talk to you? I have nothing to hide. I think you're being a bit of a fool. Why? I don't believe for a minute you told your wife you were going on holiday. Why don't you phone her? How can I phone her? Well, we get to Neon in about an hour. You could get off there and call her. Put her mind at rest. I may do. Good. Here, have a drink. Thank you. Hm. I know what you think. You think this is all part of some plan, don't you? I mean, I'm going to disappear, leave my wife and kids. I've got a good marriage. Why should I do that? I don't know. I've got a good job, pension, nice house, even the reputation of being a town hero. That's not now. Oh, I'm not Scott of the Antarctic anymore. No, more like Blackbeard the Pirate. Yeah. Yeah, and you think I'm going to the South to lie low for a few months so she can collect. Maybe you even think she's in on it. Eh? She'll bring the kids out to join me after it's all blown over. Well? Do you, Mr. Gamble? Why did you tell Miss Hicks that Henry would stolen that money? Because it's true. It's not true! Oh, Angela, stop trying to cover up for him. It's too late. What do you mean, Mr. Sayers? It's too late. I caught him out. I paid the money back myself. You're in a hopeless financial mess, aren't you, Mrs. Cornwallis? Oh, that's nonsense! So many unpaid bills there, I don't know why you haven't got the bailiff to. Henry did not steal that money! I'm afraid he did, Angela, and I am going to tell the police all about it. Because he's coming back. Before all this started, and right up to the time when you heard he might be still alive, you didn't say any of these awful things about him. But now you're going back on everything you said. What did you say, Mr. Sayers? Oh, Angela, for God's sake. He was going to look after me. There would be no need for dragging out skeletons, no scandal. Eventually, we would get married. Angela, Go please. On. Go on, that was when you thought he was dead. But now things have changed, haven't they, Percy? Now he's coming back, I've told you I won't marry you. So you're going to blacken his name to the police, to the town, to everybody. That's the sort of man you are, out of spite. You realize there isn't a word of truth in what you're saying. She's gone stark raving mad. Look, I didn't tell the police about the money out of spite. She trapped me into it. Is it worth marrying me at any price? No matter what you do to Henry. It's Henry, isn't it? Oh, I saw Philip's competition in the newspapers. And well, maybe not up to the north wall of the Iger standard, but I can climb. And I said to Angie, this is me. Because once I'm given a challenge, boy, there's no stopping me. <laughs> On the top of that mountain, in under six hours, or five thousand quid. I had to get to know every rock and cranny. I packed that hut at home with information. Everything that was ever written about Shadow Valley is in there. I must owe the library about twenty quid in unreturned books. <laughs> yes. I locked myself in that room. Pictures, bottles, sound effects, and pulses. I tried to find out about Paulson. Uh, uh, what, what about Paulson? Oh, the young lad, a student who fell down a crevasse there ten years ago. But I can't understand why he did, because it's so easy. You're a real outdoors type, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, every day. Every year I take Angie and the kids to Borrowdale. Always out on those rocks. Mad about climbing. You'll never catch me climbing a mountain, or jumping a horse, or even walking a dog. I'm an indoors man myself. Oh, gee. Uh, tell me, Mr. Cornwallis, uh, do you believe in the spirit of adventure? Oh, yes, I do. Right, and do you believe that Britain's a second-rate power today because she's lost it? I say that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Trouble is, I get vertigo just looking up at a high wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, tell me, let me get this straight. You're a happily married bank manager's assistant, and you like climbing, so you go in for a competition for £5,000. Ah, I mean, you could do with the money. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, now you're getting to know me. You tell your wife you're going on a holiday after the climb, and you set out. That's right. <laughs> you, uh, you cross this crevasse. You throw down the equipment you won't need for the rest of the climb. But you've lost so much time that you don't bother to get to the top. You uh, cut across the mountains, spend 12 days in the fresh air, and now you're on the way to the Riviera. Right? Right. And meanwhile, back at home, your wife hasn't told anyone about the holiday. And she lets your good friend Sayers, who's accusing you of theft, open a memorial fund. I think we ought to go and eat, don't you, Henry? I think the best way to cure a cold is to feed it. All right. You force my hand. 
I'll tell you everything you want to know about Henry Cornwallis. Yes. Hero, family man, ordinary nice little suburban type. It's a joke. Percy, I'm warning you. You'll never walk into this house again. You'd never guess it, would you? We're supposed to be in love. Oh, she's please. going to go on defending this man till she's blue in the face. Well, not me. I'm not that wet. You hate him. This man? He's a catastrophe. The intrepid Henry Cornwallis. We laughed ourselves sick when we read that stuff in the newspapers. You don't think for a single moment, do you, that Henry intended to climb that mountain? Of course he intended to. Are you suggesting that he only entered the competition so that he could quietly disappear and hope that someone would start a fund for his family? Well, I wouldn't put that past him. The point is this, if ever a man was without courage, it's Henry Cornwallis. He used to take you to Borrowdale, didn't he? He'd leave you each day, every day. All day he'd be away mountain climbing, he said. I don't believe he ever climbed a mountain in his life. Percy, please! No! Look at that woman. She's had 15 years of misery with this man and now she intends to stand by him. Well, not me. I have watched him. He's left her twice. He's made a mess of everything he ever laid his hands on. They're broke now because he insists on living beyond their means. That's my fault! He's terrorizes those children. The last six months and now this mountain business is the only which way to turn in this house. Not true, any of it! All right, fly your bloody kite for him. I'll tell you one thing, Angela. I do understand now. You haven't meant a single word you've said to me, have you? It's Henry. You came to me as a convenience. Are you incapable of loving? I think you should hear the rest of those tapes. who entered that competition had the same idea. To conquer something inside themselves, to do better, or just simply to be brave. This escapade of yours, Cornwallis, has made a mockery of all that. You defile that idea, you fatten it. You've taken us all for a ride, and the terrible thing is, it looks as if you're going to get away with it. I'm not concerned about what you think. Well, Mr. Cornwallis, how did you cross that crevasse? In the usual way, I straddled it. And then you hammered pitons into the upper lip and worked your way up. That's right, yeah. And these photographs were given to me by Mr. Phillips. It's the crevasse in question, uh, just above where some of your uh, equipment was found. Uh, there are several pitons hammered in here. Uh, which ones are yours? Well, how would I know? You've seen one piton, you've seen them all. Uh, there are four sets of pitons. Uh, can you see them? Yes. Well, you were the fifth one to go up, weren't you? Yes. Well, these belong to the four climbers who went up before you. Now, where are yours? Oh, no, no, no. You see, one of those will be mine. I mean, someone must have used another climber's piton. But they didn't. I have statements from the first four. Each one of them hammered in his own pitons. Not one of them trusted his weight to another climber's piton. Well, I wouldn't know. You haven't got a case. Your story is so absurd, I can't believe you expect anyone to credit it. I said before, I'm not concerned. Well, listen, Cornwallis, there's a... Oh. Thank you. Yep. There's a warrant for your arrest. It might involve your wife. Now, I want to know what happened. I'll tell you what happened. He funked it. That's what happened. He was frightened to death. I was not. I crossed it. Oh, no, you didn't. You started to shake like a jelly when you got near Poulsen's gap, and that's when this scheme entered your head. You said that again, you little bastard. No, you no, won't. He's right, didn't he? You were afraid of that drop. You thought you'd fall. I did not. You're the running away type, aren't you? You're a coward. A coward. You ran away, and you're going into hiding. He couldn't cross the road without having the jitters. He's right, isn't he, Cornwallis? You're a fake, a tin hero. What do you know about it? Oh, what about what? About fear or courage. What do you know about it? All right, you want to know, you want to know what happened, you want to know, I'll tell you. I saw Bolson, that's what happened. I saw John Bolson. There's a biting wind on a raw day at 12,000 feet. Or there could be a mist of driving rain. Ah, oh, there's a scrap of loose 
Cross Rock. About 150 yards this side of Wilson's Gap. That mustn't tumble. Each foot placed firm, deep, in prison. Oh, my God. There's a spiral hot feeling from my stomach to my throat. Oh, my God. There's a spiral hot feeling from my stomach to my throat. I can hear his voice. I can hear his bloody voice. <laughs> Look, don't you lecture me on what I should be feeling. You can call it what you damn well like, but I've faced it. And if you call me a coward again, I really will. Paul Morris, you're not the only one who's been afraid. Why are you ashamed of being afraid? I'm not ashamed of anything. Then say it. You didn't cross that crevasse because you were frozen up with fear and all you could see was Pulsar. Well, for God's sake. That's all you've got to say. You know, it happened to me when I joined the force. I kept on thinking, there'll come a day when I'll be standing there and somebody will pull a gun. <laughs> It'll happen, I thought, and I'll be paralyzed with fear. I, well, I used to tremble just imagining what it would be like. And then one day it happened. Outside a jeweler shop, a young thug pulled a gun. My first thought was, if I move, he squeezes the trigger. <laughs> fear. It was white. White fear. You could smell it, taste it. You seize up. You're quite helpless. It's all right, Paul Morris. We all have it. White fear, yes. My father used to threaten me with a beating. It terrified me just waiting for it. Didn't know his own strength, so he held off, but I knew it would come. I was so scared, I used to take it out on the little kids. I had to be on top. I, I wasn't the one who was going to get hurt. Well, then one day he did beat me. Dumb nearly crippled me. Don't you think you ought to see some kind of specialist? Why take up climbing? Well, that's something you can do alone. I mean, uh, away from everybody. You, you can prove yourself. We go on holiday and I'd go off for the day, every day, alone. I'd start with the, the, the little rocks. <laughs> Stupid little rocks. You could walk up them. They'd be kids' jumps. I mean... You'd laugh if you could see how small they were. Well, they frightened me. When I got home at night, I'd tell the kids stories about these severe climbs that I'd done in my imagination. You know, the, the overhangs, the vertical ones. But then, eventually, one day, I did climb one. It terrified me to death, but I did it. I spent ages in that mountain hut at home, trying to work out these things that... You know, what things? Well, all these things I've been trying to tell you, I mean, why the big ones pick on the little ones, why I've spent all my life taking it out on Angie and the kids. Well, well I mean, look at me. I became a bank clerk, a big strapping fellow like me. What's that got to do with it? Well, I look more like a rugby forward, wouldn't you say? I don't know what he's talking yeah, about. Go on. I was. I was a front row forward at school. Always in the front row, though I didn't want to be. It was always me who had to fight other people's battles for them. They always pushed me forward, because I looked like a big bastard. Inside, I wasn't a big bastard. I was just as small as them inside. So, so you went into a bank for, for a bit of peace? So I'd thump them to keep them in their place. Yes. Right, you're right. That's why I went into the bank, because I thought I'd be respected there for something else. Something more than just brute force. Only I didn't have anything more than that. I was expected to keep the ugly customers in their place, you know, the arrogant ones, the difficult ones. Send for Cornwallis if that bloke cuts up rough. Quite good at figures. Not much brains, a kind of hired thug. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. You horrible great rock. You're a bloody monster with voices. Angie, Angie, I want you to know that if I beat that, I shall be a real man. Angie, Angie, if I climb Sharidal and I don't hear those echoes, I shall be a real man. That's God up there. God. I'm nothing. Nothing at all. 
Paulson tried. And he was only young. Oh, Paulson! Oh, Angie, I've failed you. I have. I have really failed you. I can't do anything. I can't. I, I just... <laughs> All right, then. Let's start again. Today, it's a lovely day. I'm no tiger, but I'm not feeling dizzy. So, on goes the clinker nailing, and we're going to climb a mountain. We bought a new house, so we couldn't afford it. So why buy it? Well, for my wife to show we were on the up and up. I mean, we've been living in this pokey flat. I've been driving a mini. But now I was promoted, and Angela said, what's the use of getting promotion if you've nothing to show for it? No, no, I said that. So, you were living above your income? Oh, God, they were roused. I left home. I hit Angie and the kids. Couldn't have bought the house, should you? Well, I was in debt. Sarah wouldn't let me have an overdraft. I couldn't get the money from anywhere. I'm... Oh, I was out of my mind, I suppose. And then on top of all that, I discovered that Sayers... Angela was having an affair with Sayers. I was going to beat him up. I... Well, instead, that, that, that's when I saw your competition in the newspapers. The mountain? Yes. It was a cure, you understand. It was a way out. She wanted him all right. She could have him. Let him take over the kids, pay the bloody bills. Also, I'd have 300 quid off him for the equipment for that. Part. I knew he'd ever report me for it. I really buried myself in that room. I'd climb it. 5,000 quid, but more than that. I was going to beat the fear. Five more yards and I'm there. But the big danger is still to come. There's a layer of fresh snow on the top. So, drive the pick in deep. Make sure the crampons hold. Now, haul yourself over. <coughs> on your belly now. <coughs> Lie secure. Look down. That's where Poulsen went. That's where he is now, in a lump of ice. Solid. Don't think of it. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> Wasn't the voice. It was just the wind. Mm. So, take the piton hammer and the piton. Reach out. Bolton! Bolton! Suddenly, I was the white hope of Mersham, intrepid, fearless. <laughs> I opened bazaars, I addressed the townswomen's guild. I was going to climb a mountain and put my town on the map. Oh, it was all marvellous. Until it started Until to dawn. Until it started to dawn on you that you really had to climb that mountain. Well, I intended to. I mean, it was my life now, my... Salvation. Yes. Oh, I, I rehearsed it day in, day out. And I'd cut all the corners. I'd beaten Paulson's voice. You heard him? Oh, several times, yes. yes but, but not anymore now. I wasn't afraid. I could do it. I'd come home and for the first time in my life, I'd really be somebody. Well, I arrived on the 12th and I put my luggage in a locker on Potterville Station and I went straight up to the hut because I wanted to acclimatize. Now, on the day of the climb, you marked me off number five. Yes, and I... I remember looking up as I started and thinking, God, what am I doing? Well, why go on? To prove it? But <laughs> you're sick with having to prove it. It was a hell of a wind, I remember. One hell of a wind. And then, just as I got to the cravat, it, it stopped, you see. It was all, I don't know, hollow, no, no sound. And I, I'd not rehearsed it like this. I, I'd always done it with a wind. So you reach the edge of the crevasse, you look down, and you imagine you see Pulsar. Yes, I, I, all around me, this white fear. Oh, God. I can't do it. I, I failed. He was... He was down there look, looking up at me with, with snow on his face and... Oh, God, I, I, I'd have thrown myself down there if I'd had any guts. I just dropped 
the rope and other things. They just fell from my hand. And I ran round the river rock. The whole town was laughing. I just ran and ran and ran. And then I hid. I think I, I came down to Potterville once for some food, but and I went back up again to a shepherd's hut. Uh, the intrepid Cornwallis. There's nobody here going to help you, Henry. Here it's between you and God. Just between you and God. My husband's mad. He didn't defraud anybody. He just can't cope with life. That big man. He's not up to it. I'm not strong myself. I wanted a man who could make decisions and move mountains. In a way, it's my fault. I expected too much. What will you do if he comes back? I don't know. He knows about Percy and me. Perhaps he could begin again somewhere else. I did love him, if he was honest, and I'd have to change. I don't know if I could. And if he's dead, would you marry Mr. Sayers? No, not now. But it doesn't matter about us, really, any of us, to the children. They'd have to be protected. We really had our chance, haven't we? Look here. We get to Neon in ten minutes. We'll get off there, take the first train home. Now that you need to fight, go home and face it. We all have the same problems. We don't just run away like this. What problems have you got? You don't know what problems are. He's right, Cornwallis. You've got to go back. There'll be no arrest. I'll see to that. Sorry I mucked up your mountain. Ah, oh, that's all right. They managed to finish the climb. Suppose I did go home. Could try. Though I've sort of burned my bridges. And build up again. While there's life, there's hope. I mean, where am I going? Just nowhere into nothing. It's all back there. Yes, all right. Yes, I'll just go and tidy up a bit and then we'll get back. Now I'll have that apology gamble. Mm -hmm. Remember? You insisted he was dead and all the time I insisted he wasn't. I don't think I owe you an apology. If anything, you owe him one. He is dead. He's been dead for a long time. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I didn't expect you to. I owe him an apology. What do you mean? You let a sick man go up that mountain. You're like a quack with a patent medicine. Here, take this pill marked Spirit of Adventure. And rule Britannia, here's 5,000 quid and your confidence back guaranteed. mile an hour train death falls. Deputy Mayor launches memorial appeal. Yes, well, I'll give a couple of quid for that. Mm. It's all off the front pages today. Mersham's back to normal. Mm. Strike hits bus depot, MP's speech on immigration. You know, I didn't want that job in the first place, sir. The moment Mr. Phillips walked in, I knew it was a job I didn't want to get involved in. Oh, here we are. Nice picture of Mr. Phillips presenting the winner with £5,000 for the solo Chalibau climb. I know how you feel, Gamble. Do you, sir? Yes, I do. Oh, I, uh, I remembered you when I was in Potville, sir. Uh, it's uh, one of the centres of the watchmaking industry. Oh, you, you didn't gamble. You shouldn't have done that. Build yourself a watch, sir. Uh, get with the spirit of adventure. 